So we are not purists when it comes to sustainability. We don't shame people if they're not doing it perfectly because there's no such thing as shaming people. And if you shame companies or people that are trying to do good, well, then why would they continue to do good? So we want to uplift people that are doing good and hear from people on how they're doing good and making progressively good decisions. And hopefully um, this is where the panel comes in to share ideas on things that are happening now or things we can do to collectively make better decisions. Designers are also very powerful. So designers can be leaders in this sector because they are making choices at the front end on how the product is going to come to life. So they can play a really critical role in the decisions we're making. Of course, they also have to learn how to see those things through to a commercially viable product. And we've got some, some really interesting different size companies here to talk about the challenges of, you know, some a, a big, big company like Carhartt's been around for a long time, or a Hoffman who's smaller, but it's been really um, leading this charge at a different scale. All of them have different kinds of challenges. So uh, I'm going to ask each of you meaning our panelists, to describe sort of what progressive good might mean to you after I introduce you. So I'll introduce first and then I'll turn back to you. So first, please meet um, Colleen Howe, Director of Global Product Development from Carhartt. So Colleen has been with Carhartt for nearly seven years and is leading the product innovation efforts for the brand. Um, prior to this work, she worked in insights and strategy for Carhartt, where she spent her days immersed in the world of, of the Carhartt consumer. This is a very important part of some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Um, her 20 plus years of professional experience have also spanned roles in social justice research in academia, agency work in supporting brands to be innovative, and working at a leading automotive, uh, automotive brand to redefine and develop relevant brand opportunities. She's a social scientist with an undergraduate and a graduate degree in sociology and comes from a family business of small owners, entrepreneurs, where she learned the value of being scrappy, which I love. We're scrappy every single day. Something that was left off her bio that I want to share with you because I, I, I'm just blown away by it. So she was named one of the 25 most valuable um, and influential leaders in innovation. And when I say that, understand who she was on the list with, like Elon Musk, okay? Elon Musk, come on. Um, you know, the CEO of Netflix, other executives from, you know, Zoom and PepsiCo and General Motors and Amazon and Starbucks, et cetera. This is Colleen Howe, folks. So welcome, so welcome. Right, right. Claps from the online. That's right, so big claps. Um, Next, we're going to introduce Dana Davis, um, Vice President of Sustainability and Business Strategy for Mara Hoffman. Um, she's been very instrumental in the brand shift towards a more responsible manufacturing and supply chain over the last six years. No, nope, six years. This is not something that happens fast. Um, she also acts as an advisor in the New Fashion Initiative, Threefold, New York City Workforce Development Coalition, and also engaged with industry organizations, educators, and innovators such as Fashion Positive, Textile Exchange, the CFDA, and SAC. Um, I will tell you that, you know, we've known Dana for a while now, too, and um, she is swimming in waters where these things are changing and where a lot of things are being uh, tried. So it'll be interesting to hear from Dana. She's a keen enthusiast of regenerative farming and spends her personal time gardening and landscaping, and her husband, George, and two children, Penelope and Phoenix. <laughs> Um, and then we have Kristen Berkey, who is the founding and managing partner of Because Capital. Um, this is a new um, investment and innovation firm focused on acquiring U.S. apparel factories. Pause for a moment. Is that smart right now? Okay, so we'll address like why is that a good idea right now and how, is it, how does that tie into sustainability? It sounds crazy, but it is not. Uh, Christian also uh, started in the industry as founder of a sustainable luxury brand called Laszlo, which he organized and uh, was recognized as a leading global innovator by Ashoka. Um, Laszlo custom developed organic fabrics and set up a cut and sew operation in Detroit. 
Kristen is also a fellow uh, founding board member of the Industrial Sewing Innovation Center and co-founder of Nimbly, an apparel startup building building out digital infrastructure to move from supply driven to a demand driven system. Again, very important in sustainability. If you're making on demand, you're reducing waste. And uh, he also holds a degree from Princeton. So there you go. This is who we have on our panel, very impressive. So um, Colleen, why don't we start with you and, and maybe you can share, well, what is progressive good? What is that term? How does that resonate to you with your objectives and goals within Carhartt. First off, thank you so much for having me. Sorry, I am remote. Um, it's actually better I am because I do have a cold and you know, these days you sneeze once and you're like, oh, sorry, it's the plague. <laughs> so it's probably better I'm not there. Um, and I do, before you answer that question, Jen, I just want to sort of point out maybe the elephant in the room, which is that I'm a social scientist and I was asked to talk about like this idea of even design or designing and sustainability and, and progressive good. And I guess just, you know, know that I come at everything from the, the consumer and the human perspective. I actually started my career in the building next to where you're all sitting right now at the AAB building of Wayne State doing social justice research for seven years. So in that case, we were doing good with social programs. Now I'm super excited to be working for a company that says, hey, you know, it's not just about profits. And truly, they believe this. It's about how we treat our people who work at Carhartt, how we treat the people who make our goods all over the world, how we treat the people who wear our goods, how we leave our communities, how we leave the environment and the planet. And, you know, Carhartt's such an interesting brand because I almost feel like there are people who think we're behind when it comes to sustainability, but I was talking to a recent hire who came from the appliance industry, and we were discussing how that industry has actually, they they talk a lot of sustainability, but what they don't do is they don't build their products to last. And anyone who's bought an appliance in the last few years knows this, but Carhartt does. And being on the product innovation team, I get to see firsthand how much time we spend making sure that whatever product goods that you're going to buy from us are going to last as long as they possibly can. So for me, you think about progressive good, you have to think about people, you have to think about planet, um, and you have to think about the product we put out there and making sure that we're not just making stuff because we want to sell more. But for me, is there a need for this in the marketplace? Is there a use for it? Um, and is it going to last you, right? We don't want to put it out there and have you have to buy another. I mean, if you want two of the jackets, great, but we don't want it to be because the other one failed. So those are those are the ways Carhartt looks at it. And, and I would say I'm, I'm very similar in those views. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that very important point, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you create waste. And one of them is by product that you don't get to keep long because it can't last. So it's a very important part. Um, Christian, please. Yeah, well, I want to just quickly jump in on something that Colleen said about the appliances. I don't know if, if anyone has read the book Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawken, but he talks about changing the incentives that we use to drive profits. So in, in the appliance world, you're making pieces with planned obsolescence so that they will come back and buy another one. And he talks about how we can look at, at redesigning consumer relationships with product to potentially services. So if you're a company that's making a, 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 you know, washing machines, your goal is to have someone buy as many washing machines as possible. Therefore, you make a product that doesn't last as long. But if your goal is to sell the service of having your clothes washed, you're going to make a washing machine that lasts as long as possible so that you don't have to keep repairing it. And so thinking through kind of how do we change the perspectives of what's driving, uh, and, and we're talking about this a lot in the fashion industry with the circular economy and, and rental models, but I think part of designing for sustainability and looking at progressive good is how do we shift not just on a product level, but from an entire business level towards systems that are more aligned with these goals. Um, and then backing up, so a little bit of my personal story is, you know, similar to Colleen, started much more in the social and environmental justice world, did not think that I would end up in the fashion industry. Um, happened to be involved in a couple of fashion shows in college, one of which was a sustainable fashion show uh, that happened right around the time that a uh, factory collapsed in Bangladesh and killed over a thousand workers. And within 72 hours, two experiences of seeing the impact that clothing had on the world and recognizing that it was not at all in line with the values that I was trying to live with, um, but also not knowing where to turn. So this is 2013 and not that sustainable menswear has, has 
solved itself, but back then it was much, much less a topic of conversation in fashion in general, but especially in men's. And so I started looking at what it would take to make clothing that was, uh, I liked how it looked and I liked how it was made. Ended up starting a brand called Laszlo where, you know, we looked at three things. One was who was it made by? Uh, and on that front, we worked with the Department of Corrections to hire uh, someone who'd learned to sew while they're in prison. The second piece was where was it made? So looking at Detroit as a place to manufacture clothing as opposed to New York or LA or some of the other places. Um, and then the third was what was it made of? So we ended up um, trying to track down a really high quality organic cotton fabric for a t-shirt. And you know, I think we'll get into this a little bit, but it, it's really not easy to try to find materials that have sustainability and quality and price point and availability as a small brand. And we ended up going all the way back to essentially the farmers that were growing this beautiful organic cotton through the spinners, through the knitters. Um, but speaking of crap, scrappy, that process of, you know, calling mills that didn't have email addresses, but had, you know, something that you could, a phone number you could find online and just going through all of the extra hurdles that you had to do to make something sustainable beyond just making a great product and selling it. Um, I think we'll we'll get more into that, but not there. Okay. Um, Dana. Um, first, thank you, Jet, for having me and Isaac. And I'm just so thrilled to be here considering we've been talking for a year. <laughs> and huge kudos to all the work that you've been doing. Um, it's really inspiring and I'm excited for the tour after. Um, a lot of the work that we do at Marhoffen parallels to what Colleen was mentioning and what you were mentioning kind of about the um, ideology behind Isaac. So for us, we're a 21 year old brand. Um, I do not come from environmental science. I actually have a degree in design. Um, so wasn't, uh, the brand also not built on the idea of sustainability. So 21 years um, old and 15 years into the business was when this shift started. So just want to highlight that, knowing that it can be done. It doesn't matter where you are in your journey. It's about making that start. Um, so uh, I got the opportunity to focus on sustainability coming from Mara. So Mara really had this, uh, this, this realization of we couldn't be doing things the way we were doing them any longer. And it was so much so that she came to me and said like, we either shut this business down or we need to change what we're doing. And that came from really understanding the impacts of this industry. And um, that was the opportunity that I was given and, and took it and um, feel really uh, honored to have had that. And so this past, so seven years now, what this journey has looked like is really re, um, defining design for us as a brand. So it isn't just about kind of making that next item, getting it out into the world and, and getting it on that customer. Of course, we've always focused on great design and wanting the consumer to feel really good. And But what now is the, some of the most important parts are looking at the people who are involved, looking at the planet, looking at um, how our garment impacts um, the world today. So that starts with in ensuring that what we're putting out there, the intention behind it. So I think Colleen mentioned not just putting something out, just to put it out, like what is the ultimate need? Is there a need for this? Why does this product exist? Um, and then looking at the materials that go into that. So as Christian said, it's not so easy. You think about this idea of sustainable materials, thinking maybe organic cotton or um, whatever it is that you're sourcing, it's, it's quite complex. Um, and then understanding the supply chain that um, that you're going to work with. So who are the people behind that product? And not just on the on the manufacturing and the cutting and sewing, but all the way into the supply chain and understanding where these resources are coming from. Um, so design for us has become such a different approach in the last seven years. There's a lot of questions that start on the onset of um, how are we going to make this? What is it going to look like when the user is done with it? What are the options that the customer has when they no longer want this item? Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, circularity. We've been able to launch um, a take back program, a repair program. Um, how do we continue to ensure that the customer has um, the tools to understand how they care for those garments? Um, so it really, through these years, that idea of good design and progressive design is not ultimately just about making that next you know, that next piece that's going to sit in somebody's closet. It's much more in depth. It's more complicated, right? Much more complicated. So, uh, you know, we had a design jam as part of a um, month of design here in Detroit. And we, what we really talked a lot about is that 
really good design takes a lot of factors into account and uh, it starts at the very front end. You know, what's the purpose? Like you, you were talking about, why are you making it? But also, how are you going to get it manufactured? And if you're designing it in a way that's going to make it unsustainable in its manufacturing process, um, you, you're, you get stuck pretty quick. So you have to be versed in a lot of things, right? So this kind of leads to the next question. And maybe since, you know, we're talking design here and then we can go around, um, is there's so many things to think about. So whether you're a small startup or you're, you know, a huge brand or, or a brand that's been around for 21 years that's reshifting, you know, there's, uh, there's not unlimited resources. The math still has to make sense. So how does a new designer or a large brand, 21 year old brand, how do you prioritize where to start? And if you've got several choices to make and you can't make all of them work because maybe the math doesn't add up, how do you prioritize? Yeah, I mean, I can speak from our, um, our approach, which was when we started this journey, it was kind of looking at our largest impacts. And so for us, we knew that that starts on the material phase. So it's kind of coming up with this more material portfolio that we as a brand believed in, that we saw as lower impact materials, and how could we ensure that we continuously went back to those materials? I think we talked about just like lead times or even just the means to find these or the prices. So those were those were really big barriers for us in the beginning of this. So what we did was we kind of narrowed down instead of this idea of having all of these different fabrics, what were the fabrics that we continue to come back to? and um, and how could we vet those materials? So the supply chain, it's beyond complex. And I, seven years ago, would have sat and said, oh, I know how, how the supply chain works. I know the process of when something, if you know, we're talking about a natural fiber, what it goes through until the reality is that I sat down and actually mapped through every part of that process. And it was even more complex than I could have imagined just to the point of where someone was like, oh, that gets sent to somebody else to do the washing and then it comes back. And like things that you never really truly think about. So if you can narrow down that material portfolio of yours and then really start to break down that supply chain, I would say that's a really good step, but that's also a very complex and hard place to start. It's, it's very complex. Right. And so this is why we have to lift up, lift up brands that are, that are diving into the complexity and starting somewhere and support those types of brands. And, and I lean think, into the brands, right? And like, that was a huge thing for us. Absolutely. It's so important. You know, collaboration. Collaboration. Right? You know, creating a network of people that you can reach out to and who are the brands in this space who have been at the forefront and been leading this. And how can you, you know, tap into them to find those successes and those challenges? And how can we collaborate around who are some of the, the people doing the right things and how can we bring, um, you know, and lift them up as well. And so I think the collaboration part also, and like getting yourself out there, being at events like this, educating yourself to find out, you know, what are the, the, the different things that you can change? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris, I'm going to come back and ask you how the uh, jump. In. Absolutely. So, yes, too. so I, I think one of the, the things that I see brands doing right now when they realize that they can't deal with everything is they just they are, we're not going to pay to, like we're going to focus on our lane, which is fine. But I think it's really important to understand, even if you're not going to address, to understand the impact of other parts of your your supply chain, and to be able to say, you know, with intention, this is where we're going to focus, but not to, you know, to have a full understanding of what your impact is to the best that you can, even if dealing with all of those issues at once is not feasible. But to be able to come at it from an informed perspective instead of coming at it from a we're just going to start here. That seems like a good segue to move to now. Um, how do you prioritize? You've got a lot of products. Quality is really important. And I mean, just where do you start? I mean, it's important for you to know that, you know, cohort manufacturers all over the world, uh, they use contract manufacturers, but they also do their own manufacturing. So you have a, a complex supply chain in itself. So how do you decide where you're going to have, do you start with what you can, where you can Im have the largest impact? How do you start? So I was taking some notes while, while I was thinking through it um, and listening to everyone else's awesome answers. I would say two key things, balance and focus. 
Anyone who works with me probably hears me say a balanced portfolio on a daily basis. I'm a big believer that you don't just want to put all your efforts in one place, right? You really want to think about those key areas where you can make a difference. And what we've decided at Carhartt, it, it's about, you know, people in the community, the environment and the workers. So then within each of those focus areas, what is it you're doing? And it's really like you said, Jen, it's like, where can you make the most impact? So if you think about Carhartt, we're a cotton forward company. A lot more than half of our materials are made of cotton. So it makes sense if you're thinking about the environment and the impact on the environment, you really would start to focus as we have in on that specific fiber. And so, you know, folk, it's like if we focused on something we don't do a lot of, like what's the impact of that? Not only going to be to our company, but to, you know, what we're trying to do for the greater good. And so we really did start to focus. And, and I was reading this example the other day, and I'm sure you've all read it. It's like, it's great to make stuff from recycled water bottles, but all you're doing is creating a market for recycled water bottles, right? So, and then, and then you're putting more plastic in the environment and it's ending up in people's bodies. And, you know, it's like, you know, once you definitely want to focus, um, you want to balance your, your portfolio, but you want to think about whatever you're focused on, making sure that the good thing you're doing doesn't have that ripple effect that downstream could be worse, which is not easy to do. So I'm hearing you say really understand the full cycle of what's behind something that is called sustainable because uh, we know there's a lot of greenwashing. Uh, brands want to be perceived as, you know, environmentally sound, sustainable. But the reality is that there is no pure version of that, really. Um, and so I'm just going to reinforce this again that, you know, I've been in settings where big brands are saying, well, we better not say we're doing this because then they're going to look over here and say, but you're not doing it here. And then we're going to get in trouble. Like, you know, what if we're not all this or all that, maybe we shouldn't say we're it at all. And so as consumers, we need to get real about that, um, about how even us as people, we're not pure, we're not perfect, but let's celebrate what we are good at and encourage us to be better human beings. The same should be to lift up brands that are doing really good work. Um, and this might be um, sort of a, a counterintuitive question, hearing how hard all this is, but are there any easy places to start with a designer? Like, is, are there a few easy things to, for any of us to do, or is that just not a word that belongs in this space? Question? I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's the answer. And maybe the answer is that all good things are are, are, are worth hard work. You know, um, maybe that's it. I think um, there are some low hanging yeah. fruits, though. You know, I, I go back to when we first started this journey. And it was ultimately about changing some of the questions that we were asking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I totally agree with Colleen. You know, it, we're taking... Right, these plastic bottles, we're turning them into a material, but that's kind of a lot of the only option when it comes to some of these performance fibers, right? Mm -hmm. And you're up against these conventional ones or this recycled one, and they're both not great, and we all know that. But if you don't have these conversations with your vendors, you don't know what exists. So I think the first part is also just getting on the phone with people and talking to them and then like letting that question lead to other questions. So there are things that people can be doing, right? This idea how complex the industry is and that people are kind of hiding behind other people is a big part of the problem. So if you can put yourself out there and yes, it's a journey and it's challenging and it's hard, but it, we all know it has to be done. So, yes. and you want to build momentum. So I always tell people there are low hanging fruits that exist. If you can do that, building up your team also. So we want to look internally and we want to get people on the journey and then, and then keep building from that. But the idea that it can't be done or that it's too hard, you've got to start somewhere. And, and I think what, what I hear you saying in some ways too, is that, um, I mean, we hear this a lot in diversity, equity, and inclusion work is that, you know, if you just check all these boxes, you can say that you're, you know, inclusive and you're diverse when the reality is that the work is never done. If you're doing the right work. It's never done. Um, Kristen, I'm, this seems like a good thing to, to talk about now is that it seems that we're talking about a value proposition, too, because, you know, let's just say that we all agree that, you know, Producing closer to consumer gets rid of a lot of waste or, or impact, shall we say. Um, and, and I'm not just talking about the US. I mean, if I'm in France, 
I try to buy stuff in France if I'm in Vietnam. So we know that helps. But in the case of the US, um, that also comes with a higher cost. And how do we address the consumer understanding of why that's important and worth paying for? And how does that cultural shift happen? The reason why I'm asking, you're investing in domestic manufacturers. So what is that value proposition and how does it play into sustainability? So I think there are a couple of different pieces to that. One is that much of what I'm looking at is not on the consumer facing side. I think that changing consumer culture is a really big challenge um that we're all having to do our piece in um really where i was looking is where's that intersection of profitability and sustainability and to me it felt like manufacturing innovation was a was an important piece of that and specifically the challenge of how do we bring production closer to home and that's not just because it's a patriotic thing to do but really there's a both a financial and an impact oriented case for that so on the impact side you're not shipping product around the world you have control, of, you know, better control of the facilities that you're in and the, and the conditions of them. You can use clean energy, um, but you also can help control how much inventory you have and you can respond to demand from consumers much quicker. And so you can move toward a system where you're producing as close to the end consumer as possible, not just in terms of distance, but also in terms of time. So we talk about kind of blending production based on inventory risks. One of the reasons it's important is that inventory, there's a huge percentage of uh, production in the apparel industry that is either not sold or sold at a steep discount that doesn't necessarily need to be made in the first place. And so if you go over 60%, right? It's like 65%. Bit of mark, wow. yeah. A third is uh, deeply discount and the third ends up in landfill pre-consumer. And if you're making 150 billion garments a year, that's a lot. It's a real number. Yeah. But going back to one of the things that, that makes this challenging is that you see, I mean, in buyers who are making the final decisions about what to purchase from a factory are being held to account on a certain standard that may be different than what the designer is being held to account on, that may be different than what the sustainability person is being held to account on. Especially as you get into larger brands, you see real silos between each of the different departments. And a buyer silo is what the cheapest price I could get per good which may not, not at the end be the cheapest overall product, but they're not given the, the latitude. What's the ownership? So if you take out any uh, excess inventory, you take out shipping, you take out missing, selling any product because a consumer wanted it, but you didn't have it because you had to guess what a consumer was going to want six months ago, you start to come up with a, a financially viable model for paying more on a per unit basis, but overall you have less money tied up in, in inventory, you're spending less on product development, you're spending less on travel, and so you start to make this total cost of ownership argument for a larger number of products to be made in the U.S. So what you're really talking about, and you and I have had this discussion before too, is it's a, di it's a different map, it's a different formula. So, you know, if, if, I'm, if brands are willing to pay for a higher cost, unit cost, but there's much lower cost in carrying inventory, then maybe they don't need the same margin. So therefore maybe the retail price doesn't need to be as much as they think it is if that supply chain is non-wasteful and it is, cash flow conservative so you don't have to pour a lot of cash into inventory it's a very good topic that we've talked about a lot just on some numbers on that i mean we're seeing a sick like you know it, if you're producing very closely tied to your your customer demand and having four to six weeks of inventory on hand you're seeing a 80 to, to 95 percent sell through at full price as opposed to 65 percent of your goods not being sold at full price and you're also seeing a 60 to 70 percent reduction in your working capital tied up in inventory those are huge numbers when you start to to play around with them in large brands that give them a lot more flexibility if they're willing to look at that whole picture so that seems like another great segue because one of the things that we we talked about here and and, and denny started is that how important collaboration is now and years ago, manufacturers and designers and brands didn't really collaborate together. It was sort of a territorial process. And it seems to me from everything I'm hearing you say is that having closer relationships to the overall supply chain network is critical in this, right? So Colin, could you, could you just speak to that a little bit? Why, why are relationships, why are your relationships with your vendors 
how are they how are they changing how how is it more important and how does that relate to design so if i'm a designer why is my relationship with the rest of the supply chain important when i would say you know i would reframe to partners which we do try to say because it's a different mindset than vendors right because we're really you know all there to work together um look at the supply chain issues we're having right now um and and how we need to have those relationships and partnerships there but I was actually, I'll answer your question, but there was another element I wanted to bring in, Jen, which is about um, not just having good relationships with your partners, but with other um, people in your industry. So I mentioned I come from automotive. I worked at Chrysler when Sergio Marchionne was the CEO, and I think he wrote this manifesto, and it was called Confessions of a Capital Junkie. And it was all about how the automotive industry was just burning through capital as the product became more complex and more technical. And his whole, you know, manifesto was about, well, I'm going to get it not totally right. So for those of you who know it, don't, <laughs> don't judge. But <laughs> what I took away from it was that, you know, you, he was really saying, hey, listen, in order for us to all like, you know, thrive in this new m mobility marketplace, we have to work together and share tech, right? You, you shouldn't have, you know, Ford spending $10 billion to create the, the the right battery for the electric vehicle and not really just share that or share the cost as an industry. So you were starting to see more of that when I left automotive where they were working together on joint ventures to share that capital. Well, I think the same thing now when you, when you look at apparel and you look at some of the advances and you look at unit of one manufacturing, right? And there's companies who are setting up to say, hey, we're not just you know, we're about working and partnering with all these different brands and different manufacturers and bringing people who typically would compete together to evolve the industry. And it's the right thing to do for the positive impact it can have on the environment and the world around us. But it's also the right thing to do from a financial perspective, because, you know, you don't want to shoulder the burden of all of that. Um, and then in, when it comes to suppliers, I was just talking to a colleague about this today, and I think this is related. So again, automotive, when Toyota had their tsunami and then they had, you know, the the um, nuclear power plant melted down, like they were a mess and they realized they did not understand their supply chain network at all below like their direct suppliers. They had no idea who they were working with. They spent years coming together to map it out and build up those relationships and put contingency plans in place. If something happened over here, we would pull lever over here. Well, then what has happened is I think all the German automotives and maybe one or two others have come together to do that collectively to say, let's map out that supply chain for automotive. Well, I think the same thing should happen for um, apparel. Why not come together you as a brand, of course, need to have those great partnerships with your suppliers, but I think it's for the greater good for all of the apparel industry to better understand your network, which can help you to, you know, look for inefficiencies. I think it could have some sustainability, um, positive sustainability impact, but it's it's more like we all have to share the burden together as we move to this next phase of apparel rather than one brand trying to solve it on their own. And I hope yeah, that answered the question. No, it did. It's, and it's really important. And that's part of why Isaac uh, was created is to do exactly that, to be a convening body um, to help uh, test and commercialize and, and proliferate good ideas instead of trying to hoard them. Um, it's sort of a, a new approach within our industry. Um, did it, how, how do you empower a designer? to think sustainably um, without letting them was just say go off the rails and create something that's completely not doable and you know cost a bazillion dollars how, how do you how do you educate and empower designers I think first comes with like access to knowledge and education right so to understand the impacts of some of those decisions that they're making also it's really great to get a designer who understands the process of manufacturing, right? So if you're making a garment and you're thinking about some of the style lines or just the, um, you know, the size of the sweep of the skirt or something, and if you know what it takes to actually lay that out on a piece of fabric and you understand the amount of material that's used, or if you were to adjust a line and then you could actually decrease your consumption, those kind of tools for a designer could ultimately change that garment and the amount of waste that's generated. Um, we've had a lot of really successful examples of that. And um, I, I always give this one because I think it's such a good one where price, like your design team 
we're small, right? So our design team uh, does product development, they do sourcing, so they definitely understand what the needs are that are going to come from the production team. We're also not necessarily siloed, you know, sustainability kind of sits across all departments. Um, but we were make, we make swimwear and we make uh, engineered prints on these swimwear. So every swimsuit has the same print in the same exact spot, which if you're printing a large repeat, there's a lot of waste that's generated from that. And we wanted to switch to digital printing, but it was expensive. You know, we talk about the cost of being more sustainable. It was expensive. And what our design team was able to do, and this came from them understanding laying out these garments on these prints, was we were able to actually use digital printing to only print the size of the pattern pieces instead of creating these longer repeats. And we actually cut down the cost and we cut down our waste. So giving design that I that ability to design outside of the box and to think creatively and also give them that challenge of this is what we're up against how would you approach this um really ultimately changed everything for us and, and uh, being on the manufacturing side more you know solidly um i can speak on the behalf of manufacturers is how important that is you know and proximity matters you know so if you're really close to a design facility or a manufacturing facility where you can come and actually see it you can quickly understand how your design decisions impact the reduction of waste or process et cetera et cetera um so this could go on for a really long time because these three people just have so much knowledge to share but i want to make sure that um, we have time for, for Q&A here, um, so I'll just ask uh, one more question um, and uh, we'll try to answer it um, with the first thing that comes to mind and then we're going to open it for Q&A. So, um, you know what, Kristen, you look the most scared, so I'm going to ask you first. So, uh, so if you could tell one designer, what can you do now, what resource you should look for to start making progressively good decisions, what would you tell them to do tomorrow? Take a breath. <laughs> Pause. Like not jump into anything until you've had a moment to take a step back and really assess so that you can have that intentional approach. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. so you don't need to rush to that decision. Yeah, I think it, it takes so much time and it's, it's I mean, if trying to get it, we're, we're talking about, a, you know, a, 15 20 year generational shift in how apparel is made i think spending a little bit of time getting your house in order and understanding where you're trying to go before you actually jump in um, now don't wait for forever but don't think that this is something that you're like you know if i don't do this in the next six weeks we're going to miss the boat like we've got a long so maybe level set your expectations for yourself and in your efforts and take some time to consider yeah. where you can have the impact and part of that is is talking to people like Dana and Colleen yeah. and doing your research before. Yeah. There's a lot of mistakes that we've a bunch of us have all made already. Yeah. We should not repeat. Yeah. 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 Definitely, I would say um, doing the networking, finding out those challenges and and successes of others. Um, that's such a good question. Of what I would say, uh, I guess rephrase the questions that you're asking people, you know, um, educate yourself. I mean, the list could go on of the things that I think one could start literally tomorrow um, and not be led with fear. You know, Jen, you talked about this idea of lifting each other up. Um, don't be afraid maybe to make the change. Like we, you, you got to start somewhere and you can do it. Um, so just, just kind of take that plunge. Um, and then evaluate the garment. I think Carhartt is such a great example of like quality things and like, what is it that you're actually making? And will somebody still want to wear this in 10, 20? There's such integrity in the design right now. Yeah. yeah, and like that, the quality, like shifting the quality, I think is really key to making good clothes. I know that's what I always continuously want to work yeah, on. No, that's, I, I, yeah. I'm totally going to cheat. I, I look like I didn't have anything to say and now I can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but I mean, I think on that part of it is like, as you understand the garment, like the, the, the quality looks very different in a t-shirt than it does in a leather jacket, than it does in a pair of socks. And being able to understand for each garment, what is our goal? And one, it might be to last as long as possible. And the other one might be to decompose. Right, um, right. Thank you. Clint, how about from your perspective? Young designers joining Carhartt, maybe they don't have, you know, where, how do you, 
How do you say we're going to start here? I mean, I agree with everything said. I mean, number one, don't go it alone. You know, we're all here to help each other. This is for the common benefit of all of us who live on this great planet. And don't like pretend like you're going to solve it yourself. And so I would say if if I put myself into a designer shoes, and remember, I'm not a designer, social scientist here, people. But if I put myself <laughs> into a designer shoes and I was joining an organization, I would say take that um don't be afraid to speak up with that outside perspective. You know, you're new to the organization. And so things that maybe have always been done a certain way, um, question it, you know, respectfully. I mean, there's that great story of the woman who would cut the the bottom and top off her ham before she'd put it in the oven. And someone one day asked why. She says, well, I don't know. My mom did it. And mom, why did you do it? Well, my oven wasn't big enough for the ham. I mean, this woman just like kept doing it because <laughs> that's what my mom did. The ends of the ham must be bad. But at the end of the day, <laughs> mom had a smaller oven. So don't, you know, question. And, and I'll tell you when we're hiring people at Carhartt, I'm looking for those new people who are going to come in with, with different experiences. So look at it with a fresh eye and say, well, where, where, what could I do? And, and also if you're a business thinking about this, don't be afraid to remind yourself you, most of us are a for-profit. I've worked in a non-for-profit. Jen, you're running a non-profit, but most, the of other direction. <laughs> most of us do work in a company that needs to make money. So look at what you can do in context of your growth goals, right? Well, I want to grow here. Well, okay. So what are the one or two things you could do to be more sustainable, to be more, you know, a part of your community. Like really it's okay to think about it in the context of your business goals too. I'm going to ask one last question that occurred to me in listening to all of you. You know, we've been really uh, talking about our um, industry inside of itself in the way all of Colleen, you, you brought up some other examples. Like there's other industries that are far ahead of our own. So how much do we look to other industries for solutions that maybe we haven't considered or outside of, you know, our, our vision in our industry that, that might be applied in this industry? Do, do you do that much? Um, do you think there's opportunity to look at other industries? I'll leave it open to whoever wants to raise your hand. Yeah, the food movement is something that we continuously go back to, even when we think about something as silly as labeling, right? Like the labels that are required on food for you to understand what you're consuming and why are we not required to do that on clothing? And that's a great you know, example. Chemicals. And, you know, if, if we were giving the consumer insight into that, they might make different choices. That's a really interesting point. Or, you know, what people are being paid as well yeah 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 i think a couple of things i don't know that there's necessarily an industry model that is outside of fashion that's exactly where we're going but i think understanding that like we're not going to solve this without the investment community we're not going to solve this without the creative storytelling community we're not going to solve it without policy and understanding how do we get outside of this kind of fashion bubble into the other groups that have similar values but very different skills or, or things that they're bringing to the table I was listening to those great answers and I forgot the question because I have a head cold. Can you repeat it? I was like, oh yeah, those are great answers. What's the question? How, how, much, how much opportunity is there to look at other oh. industries that might be, maybe there's solutions that are transferable or at least worth trying in our own? I mean, I've always, I mean, Carhartt's the only apparel company I've worked at. I've worked in pharmaceutical research to telecom. I've worked in a mall and I will tell you, I draw from every experience. There is, I, as an innovator, I'm a big believer in always looking out category. In category is important, but you can always be inspired by looking at other categories. And I mentioned automotive. I think anything that's really a manufacturing is good. Um, but, you know, also like look at the CPG world, you know, look at the health and beauty. Like there's always, you know, wearing clothes is similar to putting, you know, lotion on your face. Like they're both touching your skin. What are they looking at? What are they doing? So a hundred percent every day I'm looking outside our category. I'm a big believer in that. So in our recent uh, project with uh, Arm and Siemens, we, we had the luxury of, of getting inside of Siemens a little bit. He's not a traditional, it's not apparel. They have never had an interest in the manufacturing of apparel, but they are beginning to see that their engineering expertise 
that there might be some real applications with our industry. And it was fascinating to have a different set of eyes that didn't know the first thing about cut and sew. And they used to apologize in all our meetings. We don't know cut and sew, but what about this? And honestly, uh, that was so refreshing to have someone that didn't know the first thing about cut and sew to just say, well, how do you, why do you do it that way? So um, let's, let's open it up for questions. Uh, and yes. Uh, I'd like to dir uh, direct this question toward our two-dimensional electro guest. <laughs> and the question is, irrelevant of the field that it is, how do you imagine a sustainable future? What does that look like, Colleen? In a what larger is sense. <laughs> what does the world look like? What is it? Uh, it could be a l much larger than yeah. that. How do you... I'm not talking about any specific field. How do you imagine a sustainable future? I'm not talking about clothes, just in a much larger sense. You know, I I have a, an interesting perspective on this. Um, as a sociologist, I look at how people think and act, and I'm often brought back to thinking about how we lived 50, 60, 70 years ago. <clears throat> I think a sustainable future, potentially, if you're thinking about more environmental, um, maybe not economically sustainable, but actually to not be such a consumer driven economy. Our economy is driven by consumer consumption. It keeps us all moving. It keeps me employed. It keeps my husband employed. It will give my children jobs one day. But what has happened is the messages we have given to our culture and other cultures have as well, though maybe not to the extent we have, is consumption, consumption, consumption. Buy more, 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 more. You need new, 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 right? And what that has done, and the, they said the best, I was reading an article the other day, it challenged me not to buy any clothes this fall, which I'm trying to do, because I don't really need anything. And so it's challenging people to say, consume less. That's the best way to be sustainable. Yeah, it's great if we can make it from X, Y, Z. And when I do need to buy, I want it made from those things. But at the end of the day, consume less, which I know is not really the answer I should give, given the business I'm in, right? But at the end of the day, that's what I think about a lot. Are you saying less is more? <laughs> Depending, yeah. I mean, it can be. Not necessarily more profits for companies, but, you know, then maybe it's higher quality goods and you're charging more and it's a different profit margin and, and different structure there. But, yeah, we consume a lot. Look at where we consumed 50, 60 years ago. We are, we're, con we're consumers. That's what we call each other. <laughs> Hi, I have a couple of questions, both for Colleen and Dana. Um, one uh, for Colleen, in terms of the cotton forward nature of Carhartt that you briefly mentioned, can you talk a little bit about what some of the things are that you're doing in the cotton space material wise or like the changes that you've had or just anything around that? And I guess I'll pause there, but the other half would be for um, Dana too. It's like, what kind of fabrics are you using in the swimwear space that either you aren't using anymore or that you are now you know, excited about or leaning into? Um, and then also where are you producing? I am not as involved, but I'm actually close with a few people who are very involved in the work we're doing. So what I can probably publicly say is that we are looking at our cotton from both an environmental sustainable perspective, which doesn't necessarily mean organic, but it's like, how is it grown? What is used in, you know, left in the soil? How are the people who are picking it treated, et cetera? That's an important thing for us. Um, the other thing is, when I mentioned people, you know, if you're aware of cotton, you know, there's a certain region in the country right now where they, um, there are issues with how they're treating their workers. And so that really, I mean, I think all you know, U.S. companies are, are getting cotton from that region right now, even though a lot of cotton comes from there. So that's been a big effort for us too, to say, hey, we're, we're not going to source cotton from that region and we're going to make sure anything we had doesn't. So that's protecting people. Like we are putting, you know, we're, we're we're walking the talk like we say we care about people and we're making sure that we show up when it's important so we're looking at it from that environmental and the people perspective yeah. well, and i can also just be a little bit on cotton for us so initially we prioritized organic and looking at got certification 
Um, and now we're prioritizing recycled. So how do we continuously push innovators to make 100% recycled cotton, which we're launching in a couple of weeks, which is really exciting for us, um, which also addresses some of the issues that Colleen spoke to, but there's also a, a major shortage of organic cotton. Um, so something, and there's a lot of fraud that happens in that space. So in order for us to continue to feel good about our cotton, we feel like recycled is, is the only way forward. Um, for our swims, so seven years ago, we were using um, a, a polyamide and nylon spandex blend and a polyester and spandex blend. Um, we were able to shift quite easily into recycled versions of both of those fabrics. Um, swimwear is probably the biggest challenge I face on a daily basis. There is no such thing as sustainable swimwear. Like we can't, that that it does not exist. Um, we continue to try to make better options um, and by using those recycled options. But we know that there's issues with microfibers. Um, we actually shout out to Pyrotex, a vendor out there, really making great innovative materials. We're looking at um, trying to launch more natural based swimwear um, that still have those same performance attributes. It's really hard. Um, there are innovators. We're really behind when it comes to new innovation within performance materials. Um, there is some uh, recycled elastane that exists. Royka is probably the only supplier out there that exists that's making recycled plastic or recycled um, elastic. Uh, the last stain, sorry. And so those are things that we're continuously looking. How can we push those innovators and, and help scale them? Um, but there's not a ton of options out there. And I think, uh, you know, this brings to mind that there's so many places to have an impact on how we're having an, an impact. And so it, you know, we've even seen things like um, additives for you know, uh, petroleum-based products that will turn those into biodegradable fibers. So although maybe the original you know, fiber is a bad one, looking to science to how to, to degrade those into something the planet can absorb. And so it's, it, there's so many different levels of this. And then there's you know, products like Evernew who you know, is distilling things down to a, a cellulose level something that looks like honey and re-extruding that into a new fiber. So it's it's really in so many places that the innovation is happening. Another question? Um, yeah, hi. So first of all, this is an amazing talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we keep on talking about the production of like a new garment using sustainable materials. Um, I personally am a designer and prior factory owner. So this is like epic. <laughs> um, what I'm most concerned with right now is I work with brands and I help them upcycle, remanufacture, and I work from small mom and pop brands all the way to very large publicly traded companies. And the siloing is a huge issue. The fear is another one. Um, not enough bandwidth is a big one too. Obviously through COVID, everybody's stretched, but I'm just interested how each of you are handling, um, not recite, not uh, rented, not newly created, but the reality of, you know, progressive good, which is, we all know that there's a bunch of clothes in our closet we're going to send to thread up, but can they be repurposed and turned into something beautiful and even better? And I'm just interested in your perspectives and how each of your companies use that sort of method. Yes, we, we partner with a couple organizations. Um, Renewal Workshop is one. So we launched that in 2018. That was a, um, you know, if you have a used damaged garment, you take it back, we send it to them, they clean it, they repair it, and we then resell it. Um, we also launched a partnership with Recurate, where it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, it lives on our site, so um, it's called Full Circle. So that gives a chance. So for a, if a customer has something uh, and they no longer want to wear it, they can list it and then somebody else can purchase it directly from our site. Um, but I think there's so many other ways that you can address it, especially at the design level. So whether that's looking at dead stock materials, um, we also, at the end of the day, you know, there's product left at the end of a season, right? So what are you ultimately doing that? And we don't want to off price, off price that, like that's our last, last, last resort. Um, so as, and due to COVID we had, a lot of people canceled orders on us and we were sitting on inventory like we'd never sat on before. Um, so what we did was we took it, we worked with local dye houses, we did some great botanical dyes, we looked at how could we shift some of that so that inventory was no longer aged or not, you know, people still want something new. So it's just again about 
kind of taking something that exists and how do you um, turn it into something else? It's very hard to find factories though that will disassemble and reassemble. So if that is something that you are doing, then keep on, keep it on because it is needed in this industry. We work with Custom Collaborative. That's an organization in New York who's also doing that type of work with their, um, with their co-op. Uh, it does exist, but it's hard to find. So I think there's a lot more of that type of manufacturing that's needed. So uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. And, and like, like, can I get a couple of questions? Okay. So just because yeah. they've been waiting patiently online. Yes. We have a nice crew on here. Okay. Um, so one is um, more on the how do you capture sustainability in your annual reports? How do you report that out since? And it says uh, sustainable is quite a broad term and can, like you said, can be easily greenwashed. I can speak for Carhartt. So we're actually newer on this journey. Um, I'm not intimately involved with um, the goals anymore, but did help kick that work off a few years ago. So over the process of about 18 months, we narrowed into those categories I was talking about and what we want to impact. And so they've been building up that sustainability team at Carhartt. And I know they just hired someone who came from actually an appliance manufacturer. And we're going to start, we're setting like our ambitions, right? We want to reduce, you know, our big things are like CO2, water, energy usage. So we are going to start to report on that. I'm, Although we are a privately held company, um, I am unclear at this point as to what extent we'll be sharing that out, like on our website and whatnot, but we are newer on the journey. And I think that's okay to admit um, that hasn't been something that we were focused on and we are now. We also privately also don't have to necessarily do some of that sustainable reporting, but we lean into organizations that help. Collecting d data is very hard. Um, yeah, I, I see a lot of head shaking. So we work with Textile Exchange. Um, we do their material benchmarking annually. So that at least gives us some things to work towards year after year on our fiber uptick. And if we're hitting some of those goals, um, also uh, setting internal goals, but um, and working cross functionally to set those. Um, we have some exciting projects next year, which I can't speak yet, but will help us collect more data. But data is the hardest part. So then to be able to, yeah. you know, to publicly measure against that and speak to it, partnering up with people who can support on that is key for us. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, thanks to um, Joe, our sustainability fellow, and much, much more, um, <laughs> yeah. has, has started the process of just at least establishing the baseline. So start with where are you now? And don't be ashamed of it. Just where are you now? You can't possibly measure your progressive good if you don't know where you're starting. And not that that's an easy point, but it's just where are you now? Another question? Um, how can the fashion industry incentivize sustainability? I would flip that question and say, I think we need to punish people that aren't doing it. Uh, I think that there's a mix of wanting to celebrate and incentivize people who are leading the charge, but also needing to stop the bad actors who are A, doing terrible things to people on the planet, but also B, skewing the industry and its pricing and consumer expectations. So I would say that policy around uh, bad actors and exploitation of the environment and people is just as important, uh, just as important as one example of that is France now has it in policy. Greenwashing is now illegal, and it is mightily penalized when you are um, when you are found to be greenwashing, and that is that is a public policy they now have. You're also penalized for burning, incinerating uh, debts that are over. You can't do it. Yeah, right. So policies like that force changes. There was just one other specific point, Dana. In the swim area that you're producing, lycra is one of the fibers that is difficult to recycle and reuse. So how are you looking at the stretch and resilience needed for swimwear without lycra? Yeah, there's there are <laughs> again, I mentioned the one manufacturer who's using a recycled um, lycra, which is Royka. It is very, very hard to gain that same performance. So um, we want to continue to see people innovate in that space. So how can we support that? Um, for us, usually it's like, how can we bring, how can we share that resource? How can we possibly do R&D on it internally? Um, unfortunately, we don't have budget for that kind of thing. Uh, that's where we look to the big guys to support those types of things. But um, it's really, really hard. So what we're trying to do is how do we phase out of, um, you know, the nylon and the polyester um, and then continue to work with a recycled um, elastane. 
Yeah. So again, what we're hearing is it's hard. hard. Yeah. And so progressive good, we really believe is a mantra we should all have. Um, small steps by many are huge steps. And so, and to, to understand the decisions you're making and to understand that it all starts with design. I mean, it really, really does all start with design. Um, and I think, uh, you know, if, if you all find this, you know, a, a valuable conversation, you know, please contact us and, and let us know if there's one of these topics that we've hit on that you'd like to see us drill down into more and to have another session because we could have a hundred sessions from this one here. And there's plenty of, of people in our network that we can continue these conversations with. That's why Isaac is here. Um, and I'm going to uh, do a John, bit can of a I mention? Sorry, can I just mention one more resource? Because you were talking about yes. that. Um, and we didn't talk about furniture as like a great inspiration, furniture companies. So for anyone's interested, there's a couple of fast company articles I looked at recently about IKEA. They, number one, gave they talked about their eight principles to circularity um, from design principles for circularity. And then if you go to their website, they have this amazing blueprint that shows you by category, you can dive into how they design for repair, how they design for reuse, how do they design for all these different things. I was sharing it with some colleagues today, and it's it's an amazing resource. So if you haven't looked at it yet, I think the furniture industry can be a great inspiration to apparel and check out Ikea specifically. Sorry, Jen, that was it. <laughs> No, that's that's great. You know what's so important about that? You know, one of the big things that's difficult in this industry when you're talking sustainability and specifically upcycling, um, it's the opposite of um, planned obsolescence is how do you deconstruct something and turn it into something else? And so the way you construct is super important if you plan that part of the end of life is going to be to deconstruct it um, or to biodegrade it. So when you're designing, you're thinking end of life, if it's, you know, so, so there's so many factors here. And so that's a, that's a great, um, great, uh, I think, uh, lead uh, to, to wrap up here with. And, um, you know, stay involved with Isaac. We're going to continue to have these kind of conversations. Um, as the first national institute of this nature. We are not just training, not just producing, not just innovating, but this is a usage case facility upstairs where we're trying new things on behalf of industry so that as we find good solutions, we can help proliferate them and perhaps even help to get them funded because we're a, a nonprofit. So um, support us, you know, it costs money to, to, be, um, to be Isaac. And thanks again to Carhartt for, you know, giving us this beautiful space. But if you find this work valuable, we're, uh, we're launching a uh, digital fundraising campaign next week. You know, every contribution matters. Um, so, you know, look at your inbox next week. When you see that come in, um, you know, open your wallet and send us a, a few dollars and be a gift involved, I will say. Um, so, um, thank you very much. I hope this is one of many to come. Thank you. Thank you. Heart and all the other people that uh, support uh, Isaac. It's, it's, it's a big, big village that we're developing here. And I think Detroit can really be um, a model for, for how you face these sort of challenges. So thank you for joining. And for those that are here, we're going to go upstairs and to our Isaac. Can I just what? close with one point? Of course. Sorry, I'm jumping no, it's okay. But I mean, I, I feel like a lot of this conversation has been about burden of sustainability, which I think is the wrong framing. I mean, yes, it's a lot of work, but it's also incredibly rewarding and it's really the only option going forward. So I think being careful not to frame this is like, oh, this is so hard. I don't know how we're going to do this and more like this is a very important and exciting and meaningful way to engage with the industry. And so how do we move forward? With it? Great point, because there's plenty of success stories in sustainability. So there is opportunity in finding sustainable ways to be in this industry. And there's plenty of examples of that. So thank you for ending the point that way. Appreciate that. Thank you again. Thanks for having me.